Block stock is the topic of today's presentation. And you may be familiar with this company from when they were called Square. You may still refer to them as Square, but they had a name change and they never changed the ticker. So block stock is represented by the ticker SQ. Now this chart here by CB Insights still refers to block as Square and shows, this was just uh, from today's newsletter, shows a market cap comparison of the publicly traded and privately held companies involved in payments. And the three that we focus on would be PayPal, Adyen, and Block. And we've done a number of pieces comparing those firms. But the last time that we looked at Block was back when it was Square. And that was in this piece. I'll link to it in the description of this video. It's called a $69 billion fintech stock that's soaring. Well, that fintech stock today is worth uh, just over half of that amount. So it's a $35 billion market cap company. That's a drop of 63% over that time frame compared to a NASDAQ gain of 15%. That represents the opportunity costs that you would have had for not investing in a diversified benchmark and trying to cherry pick a stock, at least to date. Now, when we use our simple valuation ratio, which just looks at market cap divided by annualized revenues, we get 1.75, which is actually quite low. We'll touch on that uh, in this next slide, which um, might help explain some of that. So when we last looked at Block, you can see the table here on the right shows Bitcoin revenues and Bitcoin costs. And we had a real point of contention with this because at that time, of course, ICOs and crypto and everything were being quite hyped. And Stripe chose to start including Bitcoin sales as revenue. And that doesn't make any sense. And you can quickly figure out why when you start to look at the gross margins of their businesses here. So transaction-based, that's 42%. And then a gross margin of 42 Then you have subs and services, subscriptions. Uh, that's 80% gross margin, quite attractive. Hardware, of course, is a small component but has a negative gross margin. That's understandable why. And then there's Bitcoin with a 2% gross margin, which simply represents the fees that they collect when they're transacting Bitcoin on the cash pay app. So you wouldn't consider that revenue. It's pass-through costs, really, but they do for some reason. And the company even goes so far as to describe the revenues ex Bitcoin. Why they include that in revenues is just beyond us. It should have never been there in the first place and they should um, remove it because it detracts from your ability to analyze this company. So if you remove Bitcoin, then you get a simple valuation ratio of three. That's still very low. Our catalog average is six. So uh, one of the things to note, if you're a square or block shareholder, you're going to want to read this report by Hindenburg Research. So they're a short seller that came out with a report, a negative report, of course, on block. And there are a number of things in there certainly worth looking at if you're a shareholder or thinking about uh, becoming a shareholder, because there's some valid points. One involves black market use cases. So Jack Dorsey, uh, somewhat of a controversial individual who is the CEO of Block and also the founder, uh, said here, the number of hip-hop songs that include the phrase Cash App or even named Cash App is pretty incredible. It's over 1,000 or 2,000 right now. And this report points out that the artists are generally uh, not rapping about Cash App's smooth UI and robust software integration toolkit. So the use cases for Cash App largely surround illegal activities, at least in this particular setting. Um, you would be amazed, uh, as uh, may be amazed as we were, to see that you can create a Cash App account using just an email. You can then fund it from anyone else that uses Cash App and spend that money at stores. Now, there's certain limitations on the volume of money that can go through an account that has literally nothing tie it, tying it to an individual, but uh, that's why you might open multiple accounts, as this individual here has done, trying to, uh, or say multiple individuals have done here, trying to impersonate Elon Musk, when the terms for Cash App say you may not select a cash tag that misleads or deceives others as to your business or personal identity. Well, if you're somebody that spends time on social media, you see this stuff everywhere. So certainly scammers are enjoying the ability to name themselves anything they like. Now, 
of course, uh, similar to Robin Hood, we see uh, Cash App and Square or Block talking about servicing the underserved. Well, what sort of client profile do you think this app is attracting? And do you really expect to be upselling financial products to these customers that you're attracting with this app that pretty much anybody can sign up with, uh, sign up on with uh, without information tying it to a particular individual? Are these accounts easy come, easy go, or responsible young adults preparing for a life of productivity? It's hard to say, but one of their former employees, this is from the short report, it should be taken with a grain of salt, but said that 40 to 75% of accounts they reviewed were fake, involved in fraud, or re- additional accounts tied to a single individual. So this brings up a good point. Regardless of whether that's true or not, we have a legitimate concern around the true number of uniques as this could distort their acquisition costs. Here you can see this is a slide from their investor deck that talks about Cash App's acquisition cost versus the industry. So you see neo banks there, of course, low acquisition costs. Then you have retail banks. Look at Cash App and how low that is. Well, that needs to be based on the number of unique accounts. And we'd like to see that by social security number. Well, the thing is, you don't really need a social security number for Cash App. So if you don't enter one, a cash App lets you send up to $250 within any seven-day period and receive up to 1000 within any 30-day period. When you add your full name, imagine that, date of birth and the last four digits of your social, you can increase these limits. So presumably, they're able to validate last four digits against date of birth and full name and establish that you're actually who you say you are. Uh, and they do that trying to make it as fric- uh, frictionless as possible. Uh, then you can, once you have that information, increase those limits. And with Cash App, you can also pay people instantly for a fee. So this 0.5 to 1.75% fee uh, is where around 30% of Cash App's revenues come from. Now, when you look at the use cases for this app, how it's used, and who it competes against, it's a laggard, and we don't invest in laggards. So PayPal, according to this research study, is the most used payments app by 57% of U.S. adults, followed by Venmo at 38%, Zelle at 36%, and Cash App at 26%. Each of these apps has different limits and slightly different services, but we don't invest in laggards. So when you look here at this list of companies that we looked at earlier, you see PayPal clearly in the lead there, Stripe with quite a hefty valuation, and Adyen and Square, and then uh, WorldPay is another private firm. Now, one has to wonder just how saturated, at least uh, when you look at PayPal's growth, how saturated this market is. So this is a global user number for PayPal. And look, it's Uh, The growth is starting to lag there. It seems to have almost plateaued in 2022. Why is that? Well, that's hard to say, but uh, in response to perhaps slowing growth that Block is seeing, similar to PayPal, they acquired a buy now, pay later firm called Afterpay. And this was a $29 billion deal that closed in January of last year. Now, we've always thought buy now, pay later is a horrible idea because it doesn't take into account the consumer's credit score or ability to pay back the loans. The idea is that you simply let somebody make payments over a period of time without interest, and then you make money on late fees and things like that. So uh, in America, at least, companies are not required to do any due diligence before extending buy now, pay later credit. We think that's a horrible horrible idea, extending credit to people who you're not assessing for credit worthiness. Look at this statement by Forbes, spells it out, talks about how consumers look for ways to make it easier to buy what they want without incurring more more debt on credit cards. What You shouldn't be using buy now, pay later. If you have credit card debt, you should be focused on paying your credit card debt off. So this buy now, pay later business model really takes advantage sometimes of legal loopholes. And that's what this article is claiming in Australia, that uh, where buy now, pay later is used quite extensively, that this is taking advantage of loopholes. And actually, Australia is now cracking down on that. So there's a regulation risk that Block faces with their acquisition of Afterpay. So 
that uh, acquisition now represents goodwill of about $12 billion on Block's balance sheet compared to um, $14 billion in total. And when they went to acquire that firm, they uh, did an all-stock transaction, which when the deal closed, had an aggregate fair value of about $14 billion. Well, that's about $7 billion today. So the actual value they paid with their overpriced shares at the time uh, gave them somewhat of a deal. But then when you look at Afterpay's metrics, they say in the first quarter of its 2021 fiscal year, Afterpay generated $4 billion in sales from 11.2 million active customers who purchased from 63,800 active merchants. And sounds pretty exciting until you realize that it doesn't generate that much revenue for Block. And to figure out how much revenue it generates is rather difficult because this entire firm is convoluted and very difficult to analyze. So we start by coming up with this bit of information where Block says we recognize revenue from our BNPL platform as subscription and services based revenue, allocating 50 percent of revenue and gross profit from this platform to each of Square and Cash App. So in a, or um, uh, yeah, that's correct. And then they say in the first quarter of 2023, Cash App generated $3.27 billion of revenue and $931 million of gross profit. Uh, but excluding Bitcoin revenue, suddenly that falls to $1.11 billion. Why you, you have Bitcoin revenue in there in the first place is just uh, beyond us. And then that would be 39% of total revenues coming from Cash App. And then we can do the math. So if 12% of Cash App revenues come from Afterpay, then that's half of the total. Then last quarter, uh, Block saw $266 million in revenues from Buy Now, Pay Later, about 9.4% of total. Here you can see the breakdown of revenues for Cash App. You can see that instant deposit uh, feature there. Uh, nothing technologically advanced about that is um, 31% of total revenues, and they have this cash card component and these other bits, and you can see up at the top left there, afterpay revenue, half 12%. So one of the concerns that we have about this would be loss rates, not only on you know Square's lending, which they one of the things they say is, well, we have this you know cash app borrow function, they're playing around with consumer loans, and are these the sorts of individuals that you want to be loaning money to? And they point to, well, Afterpay brought on you know clients that have a, a lot higher uh, income. So somewhere around 12% of people using uh, Cash App are said to have an income over $100,000 a year, if they're telling the truth about that even. And then 30% of Afterpay individuals, when you have an income of six figures, you shouldn't be using buy now, pay later, which just shows you these are financially irresponsible people. Now, when you look here, you see that Block Now on their balance sheet has receivables representing buy now, pay later. This is funded with a mix of cash and warehouse facilities. Well, if you go into their 10K, you can see those warehouse facilities have certain covenants associated with them if loss rates increase. That could be a house of cards. It's certainly not anything that we want anything to do with. Now, Block is a difficult firm to follow, so I spent a, a good part of a day analyzing their uh, financials and going through their investor presentation, which might be one of the most convoluted things I've ever seen. It's just not intuitive. Uh, they seem to have lost their focus and are moving in about a dozen different directions. And Mr. Dorsey talks about, you know, finding all these complementary um, use cases that they can target with uh, applications for their existing customers on Cash App. Well, it all comes down to what that true number is and whether or not these are individuals that are going to be availing themselves of financial products that a typical responsible adult would be. Um, that's hard to say. Uh, the metrics are a mess, and even the company seems to realize this when they talk about excluding Bitcoin revenues when they're uh, pointing to uh, revenues for a particular line. Their segmentation is an absolute mess. Um, they've you know, taken on these warehouse financing lines with covenants, and um, we don't think that people who have a general lack of financial responsibility 
uh, utilizing a platform and selling them more products. We don't think that's going to end well. Another thing that you need to consider here is that Australia is now tightening their buy now, pay later regulations. And the question is, well, there seems to be little upside for that business and lots of potential downside, right? They're taking on all that credit risk and then they're getting, you know, this 9.4% of revenues. And, well, profitability probably take you a day to figure that out if you actually were able to deduce it from all the numbers and information and various bits that they provide. But uh, just to conclude, we don't like how Block uh, distorts or Square distorts revenues and fails to address the criminal use cases on their app. You'd wonder where the ESG types are. They're supposed to be coming out of the woodwork here, making sure that uh, everything's kosher for society. Uh, this company has become unfocused, we think, and lags key competitors. We wouldn't invest in Block or Square, even if the valuations were to become even more depressed. Now, um, I put up a Nanalyze logo here on the right. Please click that to subscribe to our channel. And then I've put another video here on the left that you might enjoy watching. Thanks for taking the time to watch this today.